When I first moved to New York City over 18 years ago, I could not be described as someone that was religious or spiritual, um, but when things happened in my life, uh, namely just relational issues and September 11th, I became very, very spiritually curious. Um, and Redeemer, the people I made friends with who happened to go to Redeemer, um, were people around whom I felt uh, were not judgmental and safe and welcoming of my criticisms, doubts, concerns, um, and questions. And so we hope that those of you here who are with us will also experience that same safe, hospitable space to process any questions that you may have about the Christian faith, because that's what um, the kind of community Redeemer has always sought to be for the past 25 years here in the city. So our speaker for tonight is Dr. Timothy Keller. He was born and raised in Pennsylvania, and in 1989, he started Redeemer Presbyterian Church here in Manhattan with his wife, Kathy, and their three sons. He's the author of multiple book publications, but is best known for his New York Times bestseller, The Reason for God and Making Sense of God. And every week, we've been highlighting a fun fact about Tim, and one this week is that he actually got a C in preaching because he was told that he had great ideas but was terrible at getting them out. The instructor actually said that he was like a teapot, but his spout was too small. Sad. So you'll be the judge if, his, if, he's still, if, he's, if the spout has changed. You'll be the judge tonight. So please join me in welcoming Tim Keller. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. <laughs> actually, I've never been short, but... Anyway, um, in the beginning of this series, we said that uh, you cannot demonstrably prove there is a God. You certainly cannot prove that there is no God, which means everybody's living to some degree by faith. And that even if you're a secular person, even if you're an atheist agnostic, you um, uh, actually are... Uh, not so much simply not believing in anything, but you've adopted a new set of beliefs about the nature of the world, of, the, of matter, of human purpose, of how rationality works. That's what we talked about the very first week. And what we're set, we set it up to say, that doesn't mean you can't make decisions about what's the best way to believe. You can compare sets of beliefs. You don't just say to the atheists, prove that atheism is true. And you can't just say to Christians, prove that Christianity is true because actually nobody can prove ultimate beliefs about reality. But you can compare the beliefs. Uh, you can compare the beliefs to see which, which, is, which set is frankly the most likely to be true. So for example, you can ask which of the beliefs uh, sets, you can look at each set and say which ones are the most consistent with our experience, which ones are the most consistent with evidence. Which ones are the most consistent with themselves, with, within itself? Uh, when you say, which of these various beliefs are consistent with our, with our experience, we mean which ones are the most livable? When we say, which of these uh, sets of beliefs are consistent with evidence? I said, we can't prove there's a God, we can't disprove there's a God, but, you, but there are arguments. Which ones are the strongest? And then lastly, you can always ask, which ones of these sets of beliefs are the most consistent with each other? Do you have a set of beliefs that you say you hold it, but you always have to smuggle in values from other sets of beliefs? So there's, there, there are ways of judging which of these sets of beliefs are the most likely true. And what we're doing in this stretch of the series is we actually are looking more at number one and number three. We're actually asking, which, uh, here's Christianity, here's secularism, let's say, and other religions, which of them deliver the best on what every human being needs to, to live? You need meaning in life. You need the ability to face suffering. You need the ability to, uh, you need to have an identity that's solid enough for the ups and downs of your performance. <laughs> uh, you need uh, happiness. You need uh, a basis for moral judgment and determining right and wrong. You need these things. And your belief systems provide those things. Which of the belief systems provide those things that we all have to have in order to live the best? Now, tonight what we're doing is we're going to look at this question, and it's actually going to be something we look at next week, too. Uh, the question is, how do you determine right and wrong? How do you determine if something's right or wrong? That's my question to you. How do you make a moral judgment? 
What's the basis for it? And this week I want to look at what is the basis for moral judgments in general, and next week, what's the basis for doing justice and supporting equal rights in particular? But this week, let's just ask that question. What's the basis for moral judgment? And what I want to do is I want to show you how every religion and culture before our modern culture, every other religion and culture, how they made moral judgments, what the basis was for moral judgments. And now, secondly, I want to look at what the secular culture, uh, how the secular culture gives us a basis for moral judgment. And I'm going to try to show you that there's severe problems in our culture now. And then lastly, pretty briefly, looking more to next week actually, I want to talk about what Christianity uniquely offers us in this situation. So how everyone used to have a basis for moral judgments, how secular uh, culture today gives a basis for moral judgments and the problems with that, and lastly, Christianity's unique contribution. Now, every religion and every culture today, outside of the West, we're, the, you know, Western culture is pretty secular, but, but in the past and in non-Western cultures today, how are moral judgments grounded? What's the basis for moral judgments? What do I mean by moral judgment? A moral judgment is how do you, how do you explain uh, your moral convictions, moral obligation, and moral motivation? Let me break that down for you. All I can tell you though is, <clears throat> let me break that down for you. Moral conviction is I feel X is wrong, and I feel Y is right. So I feel you should never do X, I feel you should always do Y. And so that's what I mean by, that's moral convictions or moral feelings, okay? But then there's the question of moral obligation. See, it's one thing to say, I feel X is right. It's another thing to say, and you ought to also do X, Y, Z, whether you feel like it or not. See, so for example, what if somebody says, um, um, I think I'm a racist and I think that racism is fine. Now, it's one thing for you to say, well, I feel racism is wrong, okay? You can say that. But you don't want to just stop there, now do you? You don't want to stop there and say, you think racism is okay and I think racism is wrong. No, you want to say is even though you don't think racism is wrong, it is wrong. Even though you don't feel it's wrong, it is wrong. Even though you don't subjectively feel it's wrong, it is objectively morally wrong, right? That's the difference between just a, a moral conviction or feeling and moral obligation. In moral feeling, I think racism is right, you think racism is wrong. There we are, we both have our feelings. But moral obligation is to say, you ought to think racism is wrong whether you feel like it or not. What's the basis for that? Now, historically, all religions and all cultures answered that by saying there is a sacred order, there's a transcendent order outside of this world. So Christianity, Judaism, Islam always said if God says it's wrong, it's wrong. In other words, that's where you get moral obligation. You ought not to do X, Y, Z because God says it's wrong and therefore it is wrong. It doesn't matter how you feel. See, moral obligation was, was grounded in a sacred transcendent order. Hinduism and Buddhism have their scriptures, right? And even cultures that didn't actually have a personal God. So for example, the Greeks, um, they didn't actually believe in a heaven with a creator God, but they believed in a realm of ideas, that's Plato, or many believed in what was called this, the Logos. And the Logos was a kind of cosmic order uh, a, a kind of a, a set of moral absolutes behind the universe. And that if you were going to live a virtuous life, you had to align yourself with that moral order. Interestingly enough, uh, as far apart as they were culturally and in geographically, ancient Chinese, uh, especially Confucius. Confucius said, this is how you had to live. But Confucius didn't say, because I said so. Confucius didn't say, you must do X, Y, Z, because I said so. Confucius said, you must do X, Y, Z, because that fits in with heaven. Now, when Confucius talked about heaven, he wasn't talking about a place of uh, personal God with angels. He actually just saw it as the transcendent, supernatural realm beyond this world, 
And we, are, we have to live, uh, you might say, along, we have to align ourselves with heaven. And if we do that, that will be a virtuous life and that will be a wise life. And we'll be living, you might say, along the grain of the universe instead of against the grain of the universe. So, what's, so all religions and all cultures always said the reason why some things don't just feel wrong but actually are wrong, whether you feel like them or not, is because they're grounded in some kind of transcendent order. And you see, the idea that you was a sacred order, which means there were moral absolutes. Moral absolutes are something not inside you, those are moral feelings, but something outside of you, objective, not just subjective, something objective. And that you are, you're obligated to align yourself with that. And now, of course, by the way, Confucianism and Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity and Judaism and Islam had a lot of different opinions about what that sacred order was, right? So they didn't agree on what those moral values were. But they all had, let's just say it this way, they had a rational justification for moral obligation. So you don't have any right to tell somebody, my feelings should take preference over your feelings. When we're both human beings, we're on the same level. That's totally unjust. What right do you have to say your feelings should take preference over his or her feelings? You don't. But the reason why all religions and cultures said, no, no, we're not doing that, there is a sacred order that we all have to adhere to and align with. And even though you may disagree about that, at least people who say there's moral obligation, if there's a sacred order, it's warranted. There's a rational justification. And there's a motivation. Because unless I obey the moral absolutes, I'll destroy myself in this life, and I may actually destroy myself in eternity. So that's how people have always traditionally made moral judgments on the basis of some kind of transcendent moral social order at moral absolutes. But then the question comes up, here's the question. How do secular people do it today? How does our secular culture do it today? And I'd like to immediately, basically I'm going to make the case over the next 10 minutes or so that we have huge problems in our culture. That Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, uh, that no other cultures ever had. We have huge problems with the very idea of moral obligation, the very ability to do, make moral judgments. Now, before I get into my criticism, I got to tell you something. I am not saying that secular individual people or that secular or an atheist or an agnostic can't be good. I am not saying that. You know, one of the questions, of course, is you see, you can find on the internet all the time can we be good without God? So if somebody comes up to me and says, I'm an atheist, can I be good without God? What am I going to say? I'm going to say, yes, sure. Mark Twain was once asked, if he believed in infant baptism, you know, baptizing babies. Mark Twain was asked, do you believe in infant baptism? He says, believe in it. He says, I've seen it with my own eyes. <laughs> and so if somebody says, do you believe that an atheist can be good without God? The answer is, believe it, I've seen it. <laughs> it's, I think it's just an empirical fact, of course. In fact, there's plenty of atheists who have incredibly high moral feelings and standards, convictions. Philip Kitcher, who uh, teaches at Columbia University, is a very prominent scholar there, very popular. He's an atheist, and I had, the op I had the privilege of actually having a dialogue with him several years ago on the Columbia campus. Um, he writes this. He, he says, as an atheist, these are his moral values, and he believes that we are obligated, there's the word, by the way, so all human beings are obligated to work toward remedying or ameliorating the plight of millions, even billions of people that do not have the opportunity for a worthwhile life. We are obligated to provide equal opportunities for such a life to the entire human population. We must seek social equality for all. Now, not only is that high, you know, Here's a, he's an atheist, and not only is that incredibly high, it, it, there couldn't be, I think, a higher moral standard, but I also have no doubts that he, or maybe, I don't know him, but that plenty of, of secular people um, live according to those standards, and, and therefore, can we be good? Can you be good without God? Sure you can. But, here's my question. How do you make moral judgments, and how do you call for moral obligation? 
uh, if you're a secular person. So let me just give you an example. And I think this would kind of work uh, in New York City, maybe not elsewhere. But right now, I think the average secular person in New York City would say, you know, if, if, the, if in, over in the next country, there's people stru- starving and they're, and they're dying and they're suffering and they want to come over here, we should not build a wall. I think a lot of secular people in New York have said, we must not build a wall. We are, that would be wrong. That would be morally wrong. We need to try to do something to help them. So what if you, O oh secular person, are saying that and somebody comes along and says, why should I believe that? Hmm? Why should I believe that? Why should I believe that anybody in that other country of that other race is of any concern to me at all? I don't feel that I have any obligation to them. I feel like that's their problem. They're rotting, that's their problem. I have no moral obligation to them at all. So, okay, secular person, what does a secular person say? You feel it's wrong to let them starve. He, let's say it's a he, he says um, that there's really no reason, there's nothing wrong with, I have no obligation, there's nothing wrong with letting them starve. What do you say? You, you, you want to say you are obliged, even though you don't feel it's wrong, it is wrong. Even though you don't subjectively feel it's wrong, it's, it is objectively wrong. You are wrong to have that attitude toward those people. And what if that person says, why? Give me some reason. Now, there's four secular arguments. I know this because of all the books over the last 20 years I've been reading, looking for how do secular uh, people, you might say, ground moral obligation. And here's the four arguments. And here's also why they're so easily refuted. Number one argument is this. The first argument is, well, you can say, well, the reason why we feel that it's wrong to let the poor starve is the reason why we feel that's wrong is all of our moral feelings come from evolution. We today who have moral feelings, strong moral feelings that we should be altruistic and that we should love people and we should care for the poor, those feelings come uh, from the fact that our ancestors had those feelings and those feelings helped our ancestors survive. Their behavior and feelings helped them survive and so it's come down to us. And therefore, the reason why we feel that those things are wrong is because we evolved that way. And that's the reason why we need to follow what's actually, you know, uh, in, instilled in our genes, these moral feelings. That's what we ought to do. That's one argument, by the way. And a lot of secular uh, moralists, people trying to find a secular basis for morality, a lot of secular people say that. But you know what? You see how easy it is to refute that? Okay. So here's the counter argument. Just because... Behavior or attitude X, Y, Z help my ancestors survive. There's, that doesn't in any way oblige me to live that way. Not only that, it's actually, it's arguable whether <laughs> the feeling that I should care for the poor, I don't know how that would have helped anybody survive, frankly. But granted, for a moment, let's say your feelings come from evolutionary biology, but I... I have no obligation. Well, there's no obligation to follow a feeling that's just there because of evolution. So argument one and the counter argument is very powerful. Okay, here's argument two. Argument two is the pragmatic argument. So somebody says, why not build a wall? Why not just keep the people over there? Why not just let them rot, starve the poor? And why should I believe that we shouldn't, you know? So you say, ah, because you know what? It's just not practical. If you start doing that, if everybody's that way, everybody's like that, it will be very bad. Uh, There'll be war. Uh, There'll be strife. And therefore, it is in your best interest, it is in all of our best interest, to care for people and love people and work for equality and work for a distribution of the goods, right? That way we'll all be happier. And therefore, so that's why you ought to care for the poor. And of course, what's the counter-argument? The counter-argument is very powerful. The counter-argument says, oh, so you're really not saying it's wrong to starve the poor. What you're really saying, it's impractical. Bye, that's already lowered my motivation. And on top of that, when you say it's practical, what you really mean, it's in my best interest. In other words, you're appealing to, you're saying the reason I should not starve the poor 
is because it would be in my best selfish interest. So you're appealing to my selfishness, which is really not a great motivation. But since you're saying that my selfishness should be the basis on which I decide not to starve the poor, let me just tell you, out of my selfishness, I don't want to do it. Besides that, whenever you say, well, it's practical not to starve the poor, you know, there's always arguments on the other side that say, actually, it is practical because a lot of the poor need to die off and it'll be better for everybody. So the second argument utterly fails. There's no moral obligation. You're not even saying it's wrong. You're just saying it's impractical. The first, you're not saying it's wrong. You're just saying, well, it feels wrong because of our evolutionary biology. The third argument, it's a social consensus. Uh, I've been on, I've, I've talked to a number of very secular people who say, the reason why it's wrong to starve the poor is years ago it was okay, but now we have more and more come to see that it's wrong. And because we live in a modern society in which more and more we understand these things as being the way things ought to be, uh, and uh, it's wrong to, because we're coming to the conclusion uh, there's a social consensus developing around human rights and equal rights and, and universal benevolence and caring for the poor. Therefore, it's wrong to starve the poor. Counter-argument, again, very powerful. So you're saying that a thousand years ago when everybody, when it was a social consensus that slavery was fine, a thousand years ago, virtually everywhere in the world, social consensus slavery was fine, that it was okay. You probably, you know, is the second person going to say, yeah, I guess it was okay. No, you're going to say no, it was wrong even back then. Okay, but there was no social consensus. So come on, get me a decent argument. There was social consensus in Nazi Germany that we ought to gas and, and kill the Jews. So come on, come up with a better thing than social consensus. Okay, the fourth argument and the last argument is this. <laughs> you're just wrong. I'm sorry, it is wrong to, it's wrong to starve the poor and everybody knows it, it's common sense. All my friends know it, it's just common sense. And of course the counter argument is, if it's common sense, that means everybody should agree with you. I don't agree with you, which ergo means it's not common sense. It can't be common sense. Now here's argument five. I'm just gonna punch you out. In which case, you now have come to the position in which, in our secular society, there is no basis for moral obligation other than just power plays. And you realize how bad that is. Because when you say, you have a feeling about the poor, and I have a feeling about the poor, and my feeling needs to take preference over your feeling, this is called oppression. This is, this is called coercion. This is called saying, if I can get the power, I'm going to impose my views of things on you, and I don't have any warrant. I have no rational justification. There is no moral absolutes out here. It's just me. And, but you see, if we're equal, which is what all secular people say, we're equal, then, you, then, your, then your moral feelings ought to be equal to all other moral feelings, which means how do we ever adjudicate anything? There isn't any way to do it. Now, Alistair McIntyre wrote a fascinating book called After Virtue, uh, back in the 80s, actually, 1980s. And in it, Alistair McIntyre, first of all, starts talking about the fact that one of the marks of our secular society is we have not been able to come up with a secular basis for moral judgment. We have not been able to come up with a secular basis for moral obligation. We can't, that's one of the reasons why we're having such intractable conflicts over moral issues. Because we have nothing to do but yell. And we have, nothing, we have nothing to appeal to except the idea that my feelings should take precedence over your feelings, even though supposedly we're all equal. You say, well, let's put it to a vote. Well, don't forget, social consensus can create evil. I just showed you that. It was social consensus to have slavery. It was social consensus to intern and, and destroy the Jews. I mean, you, you can't go that way. So what's your basis for moral obligation? And Alistair McIntyre says not only has secular society not been able to reach that, uh, get a, find a basis, not only has it not, but it couldn't. He says it, the project has to fail, he says. And here's the reason why. He says if you look at all the other cultures of the world, and other religions of the world, whenever they said, this should happen, this should not happen, this, you ought to do this, you ought not to do this. It wasn't arbitrary. 
Uh, the moral standards, the moral norms of other cultures were never arbitrary. They always fit human purpose. Um, and McIntyre talks about the telos. A telos is a Greek word for your purpose. It's also, by the way, the same as the word logos, which meant the reason for something, logos, logic. The, the telos or the logo, logos was Greek words for what is the purpose of a human being? What was the human being made for? What is the purpose made for? And, he's, and McIntyre says you never really can make a moral uh, statement. You can never do a moral judgment unless you do it in line with the telos. In fact, what he says, and I'm just quote here, what he says is that um, throughout history, moral precepts were not snatched out of thin air, but in every culture, human morals got their punch, their oughtness, from the concrete notion of what human life was for, the telos or the logos. And then he gives an illustration. He says, here's a wristwatch, okay? And he, you take the wristwatch off and you say, is this a good or bad wristwatch? He says, you're not gonna be able to decide that unless you know what its purpose is. Because for example, if you say, oh, there's a nail here that's sort of sticking out of the wall, I'm gonna, I'm gonna knock it in. And you try to knock the nail in with your, your wristwatch and it breaks. The nail doesn't go in, the wristwatch breaks, and you say, what a bad wristwatch. And I said, well, no, that's not fair, because you can't judge the wristwatch as good or bad unless you know what it was made for. What was the wristwatch made for? It was made to tell time. So if it sits on your wrist and tells you what time it is, it's a good watch. And if it doesn't uh, hammer nails, it doesn't mean it's not a good watch, because that's not what it was made for. In other words, you cannot tell whether anything is good or bad unless you know what it's for. What are human beings made for? What are we here for? And what McIntyre points out is Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, every religion, every culture in the history of the world has always had an answer for that and therefore has had a basis for making moral judgments. The secular world says, well, we're just here by accident. In fact, we're here through a process of evolution, the strong eating the weak. He says, if that's the case then, you will never be able, ever, to make any kind of moral judgments about what is a good or bad human being, what is a good or bad human action. Science can tell you whether you can do something, and science can tell you how to do it really efficiently, but science can never tell you whether you ought to do it or not. Never. Because you can't get an ought from an is. Science can tell you what is, but never what it ought to be. And that's because science, all by itself, cannot tell you why you're here. That takes religion or faith. So without, without a grounding in faith, you really have no basis for moral obligation. So let me just, uh, uh, in fact, let me just, one, one other quickie. I think, I think you'll enjoy this because I want to read this to you. Um, if we really are here by accident or not for any purpose, we would say, well, in some ways, we do know something. I mean, secular people would say, we knew, do know how we got here. We got here through evolution. We got here through the strong eating the weak. But you see, again, that gives you no basis for moral obligation. We already saw that, but one of the most vivid examples of that is uh, Annie Dillard, who wrote Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, got a Pulitzer Prize for it years ago. Um, she, she actually lived by a creek in rural Virginia and she was trying to get back to nature. And she thought the closer she got to nature, the more that would, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, humanize her. In, fa in fact, however, she saw how brutal nature was. She saw the strong eating the weak. Uh, one day she watched a big water bug sting a frog and paralyze it and then stick its beak down into its skull and suck it out, suck the brain out as the, as the, you know, the, the frog just basically c collapsed like a, like a set of clothes. And she never got over it. And this is, what she, this is how she concluded. Because she was a humanist. She came thinking, if I get back to nature, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, it's going to, in a, in a sense, humanize me and make me uh, you know, care more about life. And uh, she had very strong you know, humanistic values. Here's what she said. I thought that by living by the side of the creek, it would shape my life to the free flow of the water. But I seem to have reached a point where I must draw the line. I must part ways with the only world I know. 
I value individually, I value the individual supremely, and nature values him not a whit. It looks as though I may have to reject this creek life unless I want to be utterly brutalized. Either this world, my mother, is a monster, or I myself am a freak. Consider the former. Let's imagine that the world is a monster. There is not a person in the world that behaves as badly as a praying mantis. But wait, you say, there is no right or wrong in nature. Right or wrong is a human concept. Precisely. We are moral creatures in a universe that is running on chance and death, careening blindly from nowhere to nowhere, which somehow produced wonderful us. This world runs on chance and death and power, but I cherish life and the rights of the weak versus the strong. So I crawl by, char by chance out of a sea of amino acids. I evolved by chance out of a sea of amino acids, and now I must whirl around and shake my fist at that same sea and cry, shame on you. We little blobs of soft tissue crawling around on this one planet's skin are right and the whole universe is wrong? That's one view, the world's a monster. Or consider the alternative. Maybe nature is fine and our feelings are freakishly amiss. The frog that the, the giant water bug sucked out had a rush of feeling for about a second before its brain turned to broth. I, however, have been sapped by various strong feelings about the incident almost daily. All right then. It's our emotions and our values that are amiss. We're the freaks, the world is fine. So she's saying either we are freaks and the world is fine or else the world is out of kilter, but how could the world be out of kilter? Because it's natural, it's just what it's always been. So let us all go and have lobotomies to restore us to our natural state. We can leave the library then, go back to the creek, lobotomize and live on its bank as untroubled as any muskrat or reed. You first. Um, you see what she's saying? If I am the product of evolution, then the strong eating the weak is natural, and my feelings that it's wrong is actually an illusion. Or if my, or if, if my feelings about the wrongness of violence and the strong eating the weak are real, if there are moral realities outside of me that show me that the world as it is is not good, well, what are those? How could they be there? So basically what she's trying to say is, as a secular person, she could live as if there are moral absolutes, but at that point, what is she doing? She's admitting the fact that whereas the things she sees and she knows are there, moral realities, she knows they're there, they would make more sense if there was a God than if there's not a God. And which is simply to say, as you compare secularism and, say, religion, you basically have to say, actually, religion makes more sense of your experience. And secularism tends to have to, in order to do moral obligation, because we do believe in moral obligation, don't we? And we do treat people as if they're morally obliged to do certain things. But in order to do it, secular people have to smuggle values in from other people's belief system. Otherwise, they can't work, which, again, is one of the reasons why I'm trying to say to you, as you compare these beliefs, which one seems to me the most likely to be right? The last thing I'm going to say, and it's just literally a minute here, because I want to look for next week. One of the reasons, I've, I haven't said anything specific about Christianity. And I think in, it's fair to do that, because in some ways Christianity stands over with all the other religions as saying there are moral absolutes out here, there's a moral source outside of you, and that's the basis for moral obligation. If you don't believe in that, then you're really in a difficult situation. However, Christianity was a little is unique, and I think it'll speak to something. An awful lot of people I've met in New York, and I've been here for 30 years, almost, and over the years I've met plenty of people who shed their religions. They, they grew up in various religions, and they shed them when they came here over morality. What they saw was in religious people a bigotry, an arrogance, a Phariseeism, a self-righteousness, a cruelty, and when they, they, many people actually went into a more secular mindset in order to avoid Phariseeism. Put it this way. They adopted relativism, the relativism of secularism. Relativism, secularism basically says, you know, all moral values are kind of socially constructed. So they adopted relativism to get rid of Phariseeism. But as I'm trying to show you, relativism is not a solution. What is? 
Do you remember how I mentioned that the Greeks believed that the Logos was this kind of cosmic order behind the universe and if you, if you connected to that and you lived your life according to those standards, then you'd be living wisely and virtuously. In the beginning of the book of John, Gospel of John, John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Now, clearly, the term word, which is a kind of an odd thing when you read it in English, is talking about Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, and he was God, and he was born in this world, and we saw him. But why call him the word? In the original Greek, it's calling him the logos. It was using a technical Greek philosophical term. And it was, it was the Christian's way of saying, there is a logos, there are moral absolutes, but it's not an abstract set of standards. See, if you say the moral absolutes an abstract set of standards, then I'm virtuous because I'm living according to standards and you are terrible people because you're not living according to my standards. But the Christianity says the logos is, it does exist. There is a logos, there are uh, there is a rational order behind the universe, but it's not a set of abstract standards. It's a person. It's a person. It's Jesus Christ. And there really is moral obligation. It's to know him. And through knowing him, through a personal love relationship with him, you come to the heart of the universe. You get into connection to that logos, to the heart of the universe. But because Christians believe you're not saved by living up to the moral standards, you're saved by Jesus Christ coming to earth, dying on the cross for your sins, and forgiving you, which means that you live by Jesus' love. You don't live by your uh, obeying the moral standards. That undermines Phariseeism. You say, I know a lot of Christians that are Pharisees. Okay, let me just say this. To the degree that Christians really understand the very heart of their faith, which is they're not saved by finding some heavenly set of moral standards like the Confucianists or the other uh, set of heavenly standards and living up to it and thereby feeling very proud of themselves and therefore becoming Pharisees. No, that's not Christianity. To the degree you understand, the heart of the faith is that Jesus Christ is the Logos. He came to earth. He died for you to cover over all of your wrongdoing so that you live by grace and you live by God's love what that does is it humbles you. So that on the one hand, you do have a moral absolute. You have moral absolutes, of course. The word of God, what the Bible says. But it doesn't turn you into a Pharisee. And next week, we're going to be looking much more at that. That's all the time I've got right now on this. So I'm going to ask Susan to come on up. And we're going to, I think, uh, take questions about this very big subject, which admittedly is not quite finished. That's why I'm hoping you're coming back next week. But we, I think we can cover a lot of territory this week.